All right, how's it going, everybody? This is day five of my trip through Israel. If you're just now joining us, I recommend going back to the beginning of this series, uh, starting my trip out, and then just going along with us site by site. Obviously, if you don't, not a big deal. We're going to go to different sites each episode, so you're not necessarily going to miss anything. If you just want to hear about these sites, we'll see in this day. But there are things that I just don't want to repeat a million times, and so... Um, I might reference things going back, and if you want to get the full picture, you might just want to listen to those. But as I said, this is day five. This one's going to be really interesting because uh, this was the day that everybody that was going to be with us on the remainder of the trip in Israel joined us. And so a lot of people listening uh, were with me now at this point. And um, hopefully you guys show me a little bit of grace, and uh, I'm hoping I just don't say things that are terribly off or terribly wrong. You know, this is my perception, I guess, of things. And, uh, it's also my, you know, based on the pictures I took and the notes that I wrote down and everything. So everyone's experience is going to be a little bit different, but I hope that if you were there with me, um, you kind of simultaneously find this still interesting to go through and not just like, Oh yeah, I already saw this stuff. I already, you know, experienced it myself, but hopefully it's a good reminder. Or maybe I picked up some things that, were unique from your experience. Um, so you kind of want it to be the same so that it's like accurate to someone's experience that was with me, but also slightly different. So it's interesting to listen to. So that's kind of the middle ground I'm hoping to reach for. Um, on this day five, we went to Caesarea Maritime, Mount Carmel and Megiddo. And that was kind of how we ended our day. Um, this was our first shift in hotels. And so we were going to go from one area of Israel up to a more northern portion. So um, this was when we were going to be driving up to Galilee at the end of the day, or rather Galilee area in Tiberias specifically. So that was interesting because I've never, uh, I don't want to say never actually, but it's very rare that when I go and attend the Feast of Tabernacles, I'm changing hotels. Now, if you go on vacation, maybe you go like to a, a place before you go on vacation and then you're going to stay there for a while and then you shift to your final destination. Or maybe you do like a little mini trip after your trip. Um, same thing with going to the Feast of Tabernacles. Like sometimes you go before, sometimes you go after touring to different places around. But we changed hotels so many times and it was like as a big group. So it still had this exodus feeling of, all right, everybody get your stuff ready because the next day we're going to take off together. So that was definitely a new experience. Um, had to go down fairly early in the morning and get our stuff on the bus, which was always just a, a little bit of a hassle. I mean, it was pretty organized. Like they, the organizers did a great job. It's just that anytime you involve that many people, and getting luggage down to a certain area at a certain time. And then, you know, you're in a foreign country, so you want to make sure like your stuff gets on the bus. So you want to witness it. And, you know, just gets a little confusing, but we got down there early, got our stuff on the bus and headed out for Caesarea Maritime. This is pretty cool. Uh, this place is another of Herod's kind of creations, one of his archaeological wonders, kind of a little port uh, port city by the sea. And I mean, he didn't necessarily make the entire city or anything, but his, his palace compound, uh, there was pretty impressive. And there are a lot, there are a lot of good ruins there. And this is a place mentioned in the Bible, um, a couple of times. So for that reason, I was, I was pretty excited and it's like right on the Mediterranean, which I kind of thought, I mean, I've mentioned every episode it's hot. It, It was hot this day as well. Um, still not the hottest it would get. I think that was going to be the next day, but it it was warm. And I thought, okay, we're going to go towards the Mediterranean. You're going to be on the water. So like I had thought of this all the night before, I'm like, there's going to be a nice sea breeze. It's going to be great. Well, none of that was true. Typically, you know, when I think about living in Ohio, um, if I go to like Lake Erie, there's a breeze, you know, but that's farther North. If I go to, like Hawaii is a great example. When I went to Hawaii, wow, the breeze coming off the water all the time was just like, it's what made the place bearable and kind of beautiful, honestly. So I was expecting that from Caesarea Maritime because it's right on the Mediterranean, but 
it seemed to just make it more humid. And so that was a bit of a challenge as the day went on, but still um, a great site. Really, really interesting to see. And the first thing we did when we went there, like we did every day, was go to the bathroom because, like I've said before, you got a billion people. They're all going to have to pee at different times throughout the day. So just I feel like I stopped at more bathrooms than I did archaeological sites because, wow, just it just seems like so many people always are like, oh, can we stop at the bathroom? I'm like, man, I didn't pay to stop at the bathroom, but okay. So after the bathrooms, we all got into our groups, and this was kind of the first time we saw how things were going to be split up. So um, originally, uh, for the for the pre feast part of the tour, I was on bus two with Idan, and he was uh, our guide. Now we were switching buses to our assigned bus for what was supposed to be the entirety of the feast. Now I've mentioned before, by the end of the feast. I had been on every single bus there was at some point or another. So I got to experience like all the different styles of the tour guides, which I thought was great. Um, and I just, you know, I'll have to explain what happened and how I got onto different buses. Uh, but then I was on bus three. That was my assigned bus. And our guide was Oren. Didn't know who this guy was. So I actually, I went over to Idan, who I had, you know, kind of befriended over the first few days. And I said, okay, your thing's archaeology. Oren, what's his thing? I don't know anything about him. Like, how do I, you know, what's his specialty? What's the thing I can learn from this guy that I couldn't learn from someone else? And he dons like, um, I think his thing I would say is more like, like modern culture and technology. Like he's really into that stuff. And like my heart just sank, you know, I was like, oh man, no, like that is not my area of interest at all. And it was especially upsetting because so many people there really did seem interested in that. You know, they're interested in like, how do you reclaim the water here? Or what's the economy like? Or what are your crops? And, um, you know, Israel's really famous for like, it's, it's medical progress. And so, you know, medical progress, medical, uh, technology. So, you know, there were people asking a lot of questions about that on the buses. Now at the sites themselves, obviously they're asking questions about the sites for the most part. I mean, every once in a while, man, you get questions that, I don't know. I don't want to be cynical, but it seems like sometimes people ask questions and it's like, okay, what are you going to do with that answer? Like no matter how they answer this question, what are you going to do with that? You know, they'd be like, well, what's this, uh, what's this rock over here? I see on the side, it's an interesting color. And they'd be like, I don't know, sedimentary rock. And be like, okay, like what? I just don't understand. Like what information were you hoping to gain from the guide by asking that question that doesn't really have to do with the country, doesn't really have to do with uh, the site itself. I, that was something I struggled with quite a bit, just like maintaining my composure and not wanting to just like flee the group when, There was just this like progression of questions that personally I got nothing out of, but hopefully the person that was asking or the people that were asking those kinds of questions were getting something from it because otherwise it's just, man, it was just kind of a drain on everybody's time. But, um, I tried to ask questions as much as I could, but it's, it's tough because there's times where the guide has the, the whisper device or like our little transmitter on so everybody can hear. And there's times where they don't, you know, if they're just walking forward from one place to the next in the archaeological site, sometimes they turn them off and you could just have like a personal conversation. So I tried to ask questions more at that time, unless I felt like, okay, this is something I'm genuinely wondering about the site itself that other people might be interested in. Then I just ask it in front of the group. But if it was just a personal thing or like an off handed, like theory or question about um, why something was the way it was. I just kind of do it more privately. Some people just didn't have that mentality. Now, don't get me wrong. I talked a lot. I, I had like more than my fair share of like piping up and not keeping silent. So I probably should have done better at that, honestly, and allowed other people to ask more questions, but I just couldn't stop, you know, like I was just so interested in certain things. So, uh, same can be said for Caesarea Maritime, but we've got this new guide, Oren, who, is more interested in things that I'm not interested in. So I'm like, ah, oh, man, what is the quality of my questions going to be? Or when people find out that his specialty is more like modern stuff or 
like recent, more recent Israeli history, uh, what, you know, are their questions going to reflect that? Because I'd really like to stick as close to biblical, archaeological, historical questions as possible. So I was a little bit nervous. And so we get on the bus and like, all right, well, I'm not going to think poorly of this guy that like, you know, this unsuspecting tour guide who like clearly is a tour guide, he, he's done his work to become this. So he knows what he's talking about to an extent, even if his specialty isn't like what I'm most interested in, he can still share information that's valuable to me. So I was trying to give him the benefit of the doubt and, um, just, you know, be receptive to whatever it was. It was hard to switch from guide to guide though. Like you kind of build this relationship with your bus and your guide. Um, cause you're just, you are with them all the time. And we didn't know it was going to be like that when we first got there. We kind of thought we know that some of the sites are smaller and the logistics of taking like 175 people through some of these smaller sites altogether probably wouldn't work. Um, but I didn't realize how separate the tours themselves would kind of be, you know, like almost like if you're on this bus, that's the group you're touring with. And you might have a vastly different tour than another group. Not that you're seeing different sites, but it's just what questions are asked or what's the interest or specialty of the guide or what do you have time for? You know, what does your group slow down to see versus another group might skip over and see something a little more in depth at a different part of the site. So I I didn't realize that was how it would be. And it kind of made me like a little bit uh, envious of other groups or I I don't know, just I wanted to have the best experience possible. And I didn't know what would facilitate that or who would facilitate that. But I was kind of always on the lookout. Like, are they learning this over here? I want to learn about that over there. Or, you know, I got to ask these questions of this guy right now because he knows this stuff. And so that was kind of, my mindset going into this first area. And so I, I get to speak to Oren for a little bit before, you know, as everybody's in the bathroom and he seemed like a really nice guy. And I was like, okay, I think me and this guy are going to get along. He seems really cool. Um, soft spoken, but just like gentle and kind. So, um, yeah, we'll get along fine. I'll, I'll just keep on asking questions and what he can answer. Great. What he can't. Oh, well, and we enter into the site. Obviously from the start, we can see, pretty much everything. And it's a very sprawling, like there's not any terrain. It's all very flat. There's not, there's not any mountainous terrain. There's nothing hilly. So everything's kind of laid out on the beach of the Mediterranean, uh, this archeological site. And we can kind of see the start to the end. And it might've been, I don't know exactly how long along the beach it was, maybe half a mile to a mile or something like that, that we're going to be walking uh, through this site. And it's just like all this white, um, I don't know if it's like marble or sandstone, but it just kind of, it stands out as very, uh, almost, almost European in style, all these, all these ruins. And some of those are admittedly, um, later constructions by some of the crusader period, but, uh, even all the way back into biblical times when, with Herod the great, with he, when he's building this, still a lot of the same stone is used and it was very characteristic of his buildings to, to use this kind of white stone. And even in modern Israel, um, when they're building things in certain areas, our guide was talking about how, um, there are demands that like, if you're going to build something, not only do you have to excavate, um, archeologically before you even build, you have to like dig down just to see, is there anything here that I'm going to be covering up that I shouldn't cover up, which I think is a great practice, but it's, it comes at the expense of the person trying to build, which does kind of hinder things sometimes. And then if you find something, it's, what do you do? Do you have to move sites, even though you already paid for the land? Do you have to build over top of it in some way? Can you reconfigure your construction? So all this comes into question when people are building in, in Israel anywhere. But another thing that comes into question is what are you building with? And a lot of, I think it was only for a certain time period, I don't think it's anymore, but they would demand that you would have to build, especially in Jerusalem, I think more so, but you'd have to build using this specific kind of stone that kind of spoke to this ancient style of building when when Herod was building with these white, like light tan stones. And it's a very specific kind of stone and it, it looks a certain way and it gives an age 
uh, to each building that's being built. And so they required you to use, even in the modern age, some stones just to kind of preserve that uh, ancient feel that everywhere has. And so I, I actually appreciated that, not because um, it wasn't like it was deceiving. You could tell when things were new and when things were archaeological sites that were kind of in ruins, but uh, it did, it did I think, preserve the, the ancient uh, style of things. And it made things feel just a little bit more uh, connected to history. And I, I thought that was cool. It was a good effort. And uh, I think that was just something interesting that I hadn't thought about because you see pictures of Israel and you're like, man, all this stuff kind of looks old. And well, for one, compared to America, it is old. I mean, even some of the newest buildings are pretty old. So that's something that, you know, I don't want to overlook either, but even some of the older buildings that Israel would consider newer because they're not like first century or before, um, these things were constructed in a style that was akin to, an older construction in order to preserve the history. So I think that's that's pretty cool and just something to mention. And this same thing at uh, Caesarea Maritime, a lot of this white, uh, light tan stone. And so the first part of this uh, site that we go to is a theater. And it's, I mean, it's huge. Like Herod, obviously we talked about before, Herod built that smaller theater at Herodium, which was more of a personal place for him. And at this place, though, he spared no expense. Like, this was not built into the side of a hill at all. This was, like, constructed from the ground up, and it was massive. Maybe, like, two and a half stories high or something. And so we enter in on the uh, top, kind of around the top area of this um, big theater, And as we're there, we're like trying to hear the guide, but there was a lot of groups there because remember I mentioned before, a lot of these ancient sites, they still use today for modern festivities. So on the stage there at the bottom of this theater, there were like, there was like a proper stage, you know, with scaffolding and lights and, um, sound equipment and all this stuff. So you can have like legitimate concerts there. And even some of the parts they've built up. Uh, on top of the original ruins, they've got like seat markers on there and, you know, they've got even like proper chairs and seats down at the bottom. So you can buy tickets to go to events at this place. And so we're sitting there in this theater trying to read through the biblical accounts where this site is mentioned and uh, particularly surrounding Paul. This is um, a big site in connection with the apostle Paul and his imprisonment. Um, But we just like, it was really hard to hear because there was all these like other groups coming in and they'd go up on the stage and they'd sing things or, um, we'd hear other groups being talked to. This was like one of the more populous sites that we saw just cause it's so big. So a lot of people would go there and there's not a lot of like, like some places when it's a smaller archeological site, it's a little bit more intimate because your group is the only one that can kind of get into it at a certain time. Um, And so you go in, another group might wait behind you, but here it was like, well, it's outdoors. It's like a a park, you know? So, um, a lot of different groups and different languages and all this stuff, different scriptures being read at the same time, and then music being played in the background. It was kind of a cool experience. Uh, we stopped and listened to people sing like a Christian song for a while. Um, admittedly, my initial thought was, because our, our guide was soft spoken and he, when they started singing, I was like, all right, well, he can just talk louder. And he did not. He's like, well, let's just stop and listen to them for a while. And I was like, oh man, like we don't have time to listen to a whole song. I'll hear it in the background. But, um, so this was like my first, maybe like negative thought towards Oren, even though I'm going to let you in on like the ending of this story with him. He is awesome. Like I really, really loved him as a tour guide. I didn't stay with that bus, but it had nothing to do with him. Like he was just such a kind, good hearted individual. And I, I just, I still think so fondly of him. So even though my mindset was negative at the time, he ended up, I just really had a lot of respect for him and liked him quite a bit. Um, but this was my first moment of like, oh man, no, all my worst fears coming true. Like he can't even get through his speech without being stopped from other loud things happening. And we're going to go to all these places that might be loud. So a little bit nervous about that. Um, but we read through some scriptural accounts, which was neat, and then walked down 
uh, to the base of this theater. Then we left it and went outside and started heading towards the right. So you're facing the Mediterranean and you kind of go into this theater and then off to the right. And that's kind of the direction we headed all the way down the beach. And this is um, the area where they believe that Herod, Herod's palace was right on the water. Uh, at, at the time, like when we're looking at it, we're looking out into a thing that's like you can see ruins, obviously, and they're they're pretty fairly leveled, but you can still and like there's water coming into them, and so it's pretty clear that um, potentially the water level has has risen. That's what the guide said, anyways. The water level has risen to a point that it just kind of eroded a lot of this over time. It wasn't like torn down or knocked down or anything. It's just you know over time things do wear out, especially when there's water kind of creeping in and eroding things away. And so even now at these ruins, you look out into the Mediterranean and it's like dry land. Then there's the ruins that some of them have water in them. Like you can see a whole square room where this palace would have been. And it's just covered in water and uh, almost looks like a swimming pool or something, but it's about two or three feet of water in it. And then just past those ruins is the Mediterranean proper. And so you look out uh, from this palace area And you can see um, there's like fishermen out on the water and they are like standing on the ruins fishing in the Mediterranean. So that it was on one hand, I'm like, are they allowed to be out there? Because I also kind of want to go that close and like see everything. I just I like the water. So anytime you get close to the water, I'm, I'm all for it. But also they're standing right on the ruins like. You know, a lot of these places you get to, you can get really close to things and you can touch certain things and that's, that's awesome. But, um, there's other things that have like gates around them and you can't like jump down into the, into a pit of someone's, what used to be their home. But here at the palace of King Herod, it's like, these guys are out there standing on it, fishing in it. And so I kind of wanted to be out there with them, but also I was like, maybe out of a little bit of jealousy, I'm like, they should get out of there. They shouldn't be able to fish there. They're going to ruin the ruin the site. Um, but no one else seemed to mind that they were there. So they're out there fishing on the rocks and, um, we look out onto this palace and then we start hearing about the story of Paul's imprisonment. You can find it in the book of Acts. Um, he goes from Jerusalem and he's brought all the way up to, uh, Caesarea Maritime in Northern Israel because they're afraid the Jews are going to kill him. And then actually the Jewish leaders follow him up there to make an appeal against him. So, this is a site of some of, not only was Paul here at some point, but this is kind of a, a turning point in um, Paul's life, you know, from kind of rabble rouser to, you know, the biggest turning point in Paul's life was from persecutor of the church to devout Christian and follower of Jesus Christ. But this is another one where he goes from, uh, you know, leader in the church to persecuted by his own you know, Jewish countrymen. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think this was a cool place to see. Paul is a, a just an amazing figure in history and in the Bible. And so to be at this spot that he had seen at one point is pretty cool. Now, as far as his imprisonment goes, people have different thoughts. Um, there was a spot where they believe the jail was, and it was kind of blocked off, but you could look into it. And it was underneath the ground that we were standing on, so it wasn't at ground level. And you can, you know, you look in through the gate and you can see this kind of constructed cave looking thing with arches. And they're like, yeah, this is probably the prison where Paul was held. Now, other people say that uh, Paul was probably held in the palace itself, which was kind of down by the Mediterranean, closer to where they were fishing. And because the initial prison itself was kind of back from the water a bit. And then other people say, well, no, he wasn't exactly under arrest. It seems like, uh, I mean, he was under arrest, but he didn't have like chains. He wasn't like thrown in a cell. He had a little bit of freedom and the scripture does speak to that too. So what exactly the arrangement was for Paul at this place? It's, it's kind of hard to tell, but either way, I saw the prison. I saw the palace. I saw where the city would have been. So at some point the apostle Paul stood here, uh, in this space and, um, testified on his behalf and on the behalf of Jesus Christ as well as, as a witness to him. So that's a pretty cool thing 
uh, to see. And it was nice to be outside too. I liked, I liked just being outside. Uh, we also saw, uh, this place where Paul would have set sail from. So where the boats would have come in at. And that was cool. Cause it's like, this is where Paul, after appealing to Caesar would have, um, left for Rome, you know, and that's kind of a, a little bit like the end of his story that we know of. Now there's historical things that, um, we can look to, to, fill in the gaps of Paul's story, but still cool to stand in the spot where he would have looked out to the Mediterranean and been like, okay, this is where I'm setting sail from. So, um, yeah, just to be at a site that Paul was at, that was kind of cool. It's kind of checking it off the list. You know, there's all these figures you want to connect with throughout the Bible. And you're like, okay, I've seen where Paul did this. I've seen where Peter did that. I've seen where Jesus stood here. And you're kind of like, building a connection with different characters. And this was, this was the first place we had been that, um, like for sure was directly tied to Paul's story in the book of Acts. So that was really cool. After leaving the, um, palace area on our way, kind of back, you kind of have to go out a peninsula, like a little peninsula to get to the palace area and look out onto the water. And then on our way back, we see this, um, rock, stone thing. And our guide stopped at it. There's a lot of groups stopped at this. And this is like, a. it used to be inside the theater itself. The rock here is just a replica. And the real one we did see at the museum in Jerusalem, but it's a rock that has, um, the inscription of, of Pontius Pilate on it. And so perhaps this would have been like a sign that Pilate donated this, you know, certain money to build this thing or maybe he frequented this theater and this is where he would have sat. Um, it's kind of kind of all up in the air or it could have just been a tribute to him. But either way, it's a testament to the fact that he did exist as a person that was in charge around the time of Jesus Christ. So uh, that's something worth noting as well. And we saw that on our way out and then we saw the, the little prison where potentially Paul would have been kept as well. So we keep making our way along the beach and this is where it starts to get like much more open. There's less buildings, less structures, and so uh, less places to hide from the sun. And it was really, really heating up, even though it was just the morning. And we walk into this, uh, to me, I would have called it a theater, but it's more like an arena. And there's like, on one side, you've got like, as we're walking through it, the right side has these like bleacher stones. And then the left side, um, obviously would have been the Mediterranean. So you're at this arena where they would have had games and sports and, um, things for entertainment. And you look out onto the Mediterranean it would have been a beautiful backdrop for all this stuff. Uh, the one thing I was thinking though, was like, man, this thing is so long. I mean, it was at least, at least the size of a football field, but maybe a little bit longer than that. And, if you're on one side of it and there's something happening all the way on the other side, like that'd be kind of tough to see. Um, and there's not like arena seating all the way around it. You know, it's just on the one side. So that would have been a little difficult, but also I'm sure some of the things would have been happening at different locations. So maybe they have, I don't know, someone entertaining you in the middle on the left and on the right. So everybody can see, they also had chariot races here and you could see where like the grooves of wheels were. So that was pretty neat. And you know, chariot race, you don't need to see it the entire way up close. You just got to see at certain points. So that wouldn't have been a big deal, but also what they did here was public executions. And this is where I want to talk about, I said, I'd talk about it last time, a man called Rabbi Akiva. This is a man I really, really respect. I think his story is, um, I don't, honestly, I don't know a lot about him as far as his life goes. It's more in his death. The way that he died, I think was incredibly honorable and something that, uh, Christians could learn from. And so this was a very popular rabbi during the third Jewish war, uh, like one thirties AD. And, People flocked to him and he, it was one of the rabbis that ended up joining the revolution, joining the rebellion and being an inspiration for a lot of people. And eventually Rome got a hold of him and sentenced him to death and they sentenced him to death here at Caesarea Maritime and it would have been in this arena. 
And what happened was um, the way that they chose for him to die was that he would be raked with like um, scorching tongs. So they'd, they'd heat these tongs up in a fire and then scrape them down his skin. And that's, they would do that over and over and over again until he died. It's just a absolutely brutal, horrible, horrible way to die. And so as they're doing this, he's got some of his disciples around him um, who apparently hadn't been sentenced to death yet, um, probably because Rome wanted to make an example of this man and then hopefully people would turn to not defy Rome anymore. But this man, as he's dying, as he's being raked with these tongs, starts reciting the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And he gets to a certain point and his disciples say, Rabbi, Rabbi, even in this, you recite the Shema. And he turns to them. And first of all, I don't even know how you get words out as this is happening. Maybe it's during a reprieve or something, but I would just be weeping in agony. You know, I I can't, I don't deal well with pain. I'm not terrified of death by any means, but pain is, is a whole nother beast. And I can't imagine the pain he would have been going through. And so he's reciting scripture and his disciples say, Rabbi, even in this, and he turns to them and says, um, I'm paraphrasing here, not direct quote. Obviously it's been, uh, passed down, you know, throughout time and written down. And so you'll find it written different ways. But the gist of what he said was throughout all my life, I've been given the opportunity to love the Lord, my God, with all my strength, with all my heart. And now at death, should I not or should I forsake the opportunity to love him and prove that I can love him with all my soul and with all my life? And so I thought that was just such a brilliant statement. I mean, we're supposed to bless the Lord at all times. And that can be hard at some times over other times. But to undergo persecution like this and to, you know, because the revolt they were going through it was very religiously motivated. It wasn't just like, well, we're a people that looks on Rome as oppressors and we want them out. Like, yes, that was a part of it. But also it was like, you know, we're allowed a certain amount of religious freedom, but we believe we should be following God every moment of our lives to every little jot and tittle that he has inspired to be written in scripture. And we can't do that as freely as we'd like. And so this is not only nationalistic persecution and oppression, but religious persecution and oppression. They saw these people who are Caesar worshipers, you know, they're, they're worshiping the emperor as God. And they see this as, as pagan and an affront to God. And they want deliverance. They're, they're looking back to the Exodus thinking, God, we're still in Egypt. You know, and there's writings of this in the Talmud. They're, they're sitting there saying like, we're in Egypt. We're under a foreign oppressor. When will you come and deliver us? Now, obviously, they missed the coming of Jesus Christ, unfortunately, because um, he did come to deliver them, but they they just didn't see it for what it was. But they're looking at Rome and they're thinking, okay, well, I guess we're going to try and overthrow these people because they're in violation against God and they're they're you know baseless and they're evil. And so it's very much a religious revolt happening here. And so when this man is dying, this Rabbi Akiva is dying, it's not just like, you know, I'll go back to my religion because it's what gives me strength. He's seeing himself as dying for his faith. And so even in this moment of extreme torture and persecution, I'm sure he's in pain, but he's not forsaking God uh, to the best of his ability and knowledge. He's, He's using it as an opportunity to say, I've loved God up to this point, but I'm commanded to love him with my whole life and with my whole soul. And so this is the only mode that I can even do this in. I can't prove that I love him with my life and with my soul unless my life and my soul is being taken from me. And so he gives this lesson, this final lesson to his disciples. And um, obviously he he died and that's you know a horrible thing to, to see a person go, especially when you look back on them as kind of heroic in a way. But I think it's such a testament on the way he lived his life and then ultimately the way he chose to go out of this life. So I just respect the guy and it was um, very humbling to be standing in the area where these words would have been said and he would have eventually passed. Uh, So as we made our way through the rest of the site, um, past that was the uh, area where 
Paul would have set sail from, kind of the port area. So I got a few pictures from there, and that was pretty cool. Uh, but that was pretty much the end of the tour. Uh, those those were past that, farther down to the right was more Crusader period stuff, and I was still kind of meditating on the death of Rabbi Akiva and Paul having been here uh, prior to that. And so I just had a lot to think about in this time and um, just was appreciating having been in this awesome spot. You know, this was like, man, this is, this is what I came here for was to see this stuff and to connect with each site and to connect with people from history that I respect and can learn from. So I didn't pay as much attention in the crusader part, admittedly, that tends to be how I handled myself for the remainder of the trip. Um, but I, I really did love Caesarea Maritime. So we waited there for a while, drenched in sweat, but a lot to think about. We got some, there was like some shops at the end, um, got some like iced coffee and stuff like that. So that was nice little modern touch. Uh, you know, the, at the beginning of this series, I said, you know, it's going to be like, looking at the mix of modern and archaic to see how these things are fused together. So nothing speaks to that more than going to see the death of an ancient rabbi and then drinking a nice coffee. But that's exactly what I did. And it was nice because at the end of the the thing, we didn't have to walk all the way back through the site. Our buses met us at the end. So that was good as well. Then the next place we went to was Mount Carmel. Uh, we'd already been here uh, kind of when we went to Haifa, uh, earlier in the trip, but this was kind of Mount Carmel proper. This was not just like a modern city that happens to be on Mount Carmel. This was um, like more a biblical site and or more, at least the landscape would have looked like what it did in the time of the Bible. And so that was, that was cool. And um, we get there, drive up this mountain and it's not, it wasn't terribly tall. Like I'm not saying I would have like really loved to just run up it or anything like that, but most of the mountains in the area, I feel like could be walked with enough time. And if you had to get up there, you know, it wasn't like climbing over rocks or anything. It was a a pretty gentle ascent up. And so we get to the top there. And, um, the main thing that I think they were kind of directing us to focus on was this as the area of, um, the episode of Elijah and the prophets of Baal or Baal. And, um, We can't say for certain that this was the exact spot, but we know it's the correct side of the mountain. um, And it was somewhere in this area. You know, we're on the mountain. And so this is kind of tradition says this is where it happened, um, but it could be within, you know, a mile or something. So this was kind of where they've built things as a testament to that event, even if we're not exactly sure that this is right where it happened. And, um, I kind of have an affinity for Mount Carmel. I I mentioned before because I got to teach the book of Amos to uh, the Bible college class for my church. And uh, the very beginning of that book says, uh, Carmel withers. The the Lord roars from Zion and Mount Carmel withers. And so you've got the top of this mountain just covered in greenery and vegetation. And to see that wither would have been a sign of, of desolation. And, you know, this would have been one of the last places to wither in the heat of the sun and the lack of the rain just because of its location and um, its ability to get rain. And so to say that Mount Carmel withers, that's a, that's a big thing. You know, it's like you never see it withered. And so if it's going to wither, that that's a sign of bad times. And so to be on this mountain that was spoken about just kind of prophetically in passing by Amos, that was, that was cool to me. But then also I mean, Elijah, you know, I talked about before getting connect to connect with different biblical or historical figures is cool. And so this one, like Elijah check, you can check him off the list and be like, yeah, I've been to a place that he was. And so that was, that was great. Really, really cool for that as well. So we got there to Mount Carmel and, um, up to the top of the mountain and we start, we kind of go off onto the side little area from the path under some trees And we start reading the story of Baal, uh, the prophets of Baal and the prophetesses of Asherah, which every time I read this story, or every time I think back to this story, I always remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal, but I always forget that there were prophetesses of Asherah as well. And uh, our guide, Idan, in preparation for this, this visit to Carmel, was telling us, 
kind of the history behind these two, uh, or this God and this goddess, Baal and Asherah. And what's interesting is he said that Baal was associated with the evergreen and Asherah was associated with the oak. And here at Mount Carmel, you have both of those trees. Actually, all throughout Israel, you have oaks and you have evergreens. And so these were the symbols for these gods or this god and this goddess. And this is why you get um, mention of them in the Bible when it says you should not worship under any green tree or anything like that. That's, that's what this is being talked about. And what would happen is these are uh, these gods or this god and goddess were joined in a marital union. And when they, the, the idea of these, these two deities is that they would have sex and that sex would um, basically fertilize the earth for the next year. And so if you worship these gods, what you would do is you would have orgies underneath oak or evergreen trees. And this was uh, to kind of provoke those two gods to have sex. You'd arouse the gods and provoke them to have sex, which would then uh, make for a fertile ground or fertile farmland the next year. And they'd go up to these high places to do it. And so up on Mount Carmel, we've got both oak and evergreen trees, which would have been descendants of the ones that were basically used for ritual sexual uh, orgies at the time, I guess. I don't know another way to say that. And so you've got this this scene where Elijah is confronting um, the people that had gone deep into paganism uh, in reverence towards Baal and Asherah. And they'd conduct these ceremonies underneath these trees. So he's going right to where they would consider a holy place. You know, this Mount Carmel was exactly a high place where they would go and have sex under these trees to provoke Baal and Asherah to do the same thing. And so it's not just like they chose neutral territory. When Elijah makes this kind of confrontation with these prophets and prophetesses, he is going straight to the source of their religious worship and saying, okay, this is where I'm going to fight you at. So that's, that's interesting as well. And we're surrounded by these same types of trees. Um, so we go up on Mount Carmel and we can, there's a church up there, of course, cause there's churches everywhere. Actually, I had someone ask me the question, why are there all these cathedrals? Um, well, basically, uh, in like the mid to early mid to late three hundreds AD, um, Constantine's mom, Helen or Helena went to all these different sites in Israel and asked about the tradition of where certain things happened, marked them out, and then they'd put churches on them. So that's kind of how that got started. And a lot of, that's why a lot of these are Catholic churches today, uh, or Catholic cathedrals. So that's, that's why that happened. Cause these are important sites, not just to Judaism or Christianity that respects the old Testament, but, um, to Catholics as well, and often to Muslims because they, um, in one form or another, respect the Old Testament, though not above the Quran, it seems like. So, yeah, this that's why uh, you got a lot of friction between Jewish people and Muslims because they're inhabiting the same area, respecting the same sites, and then you get Catholics thrown in there as well, and then Greek Orthodox and Catholics have their own beef, so there's all these people vying for religious space, but... Um, Constantine and his mother Helena kind of got there first. And so that's why, that's also why a lot of people think these sites are circumspect because it was already 300 something years, like over 300 years past like the new, or past like the time of Christ, you know. And then beyond that, it's however many more years past that, that it, this would just been verbal tradition handed down and down and down. There's room in there for perversion of the of the original sites so we don't know where the exact sites are the earliest you know some of the earliest traditions say that maybe these are the correct sites but it could have also just been you know helena also said she had divine dreams that showed her where the places were whenever she didn't have tradition to go off of so some of these are more credible than others this one it just seems like they picked a top a place at the top of the mountain so it's around here she wasn't like totally off. She didn't like pick a different mountain or anything, but we don't know that this was the exact site, but so there's a cathedral up there and 
cool statue of Elijah um, killing a, a prophet of Baal. So that's interesting. But what our guide was saying was, you know, when these these things were going on, you have, um, I mean, I'm sure most people are familiar with the story. If not, go and read it because it's it is definitely a compelling and really interesting one. But it's only mentioned that after Elijah succeeds in this competition, I guess, um, or rather God succeeds against uh, the prophets of Baal, um, the only ones mentioned that were killed were the prophets of Baal, not the prophetesses of Asherah. And so our guide made the point, he thinks that perhaps Elijah was hedging his bets. You know, it's like, okay, well, you know, we can't have these sexual orgies going on at the tops of these mountains, but also we kind of do need fertile land. And so let's keep some of the women around, um, not only to marry off to people, you know, that's in a sick kind of way. Like that's a resource as well, you know, wives to further the population, but, but also, um, you know, these prophetesses might speak well to Asherah. So I don't know if I could say Elijah was, only partially faithful here, but it is interesting that he left the women alive when they were just as guilty of some of these perverted rituals and pagan idol worship. So I'm not sure why he left them alive, but maybe it was by pressure from the people, but the only ones mentioned as being chased down and slaughtered and brought down to the base of the mountain were the prophets of Baal. And that's another thing we got, we get up there and I'm like, okay, well, we're going to go see the river, you know, from the top of the mountain, we're going to go see the river where this happened. And we look down and it's like dry as dust down to the bottom of this mountain. I'm like, okay, where's, if this is the right place, like, where's the river? You know, I'm looking for ways to maybe discredit the Catholic account and our guide points down, Oren points down. He's like, it's down there. I'm like, that's not, there's no river there. He's like, ah, no, no, no. River in the Bible doesn't necessarily mean that there's water there. It's just that water does flow through there at certain times of the year. And so uh, perhaps at this time there is water flowing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It could have been at any time of the year, this place where the water flows during the rainy season is still called a river. So that was something I learned because I'm thinking, in my mind, a river has water. But in the Hebrew mind, a river means a place where the water flows when there is water. So just something to think about. Um, but yeah, we, we look down, down the mountain to where this would have happened and still a pretty cool thing. But when you get to the top where this church is built, there's also this lookout point. And unfortunately for us, it was um, fairly fairly hazy in the distance and that happened quite a bit but you could still see the outline of things on the horizon and all around on the railings you've got these uh, signs pointing out to the mountains so you look down at the ground or at the railing and you can see signs that point out to this hazy you know shape in the distance and it has the names of all these mountains and so from Mount Carmel you can look out and you can see uh, Mount Hermon, Mount Tabor, and Mount Gilboa. And so that's cool because right from this spot, our guide can point out and say, that's where this happened. That's where this happened. That's where this happened. And so that was, I thought that was pretty cool because you kind of get a lot of, even though you're not directly on the site, you get a lot of biblical history um, or just history right there uh, at one spot. And um, just for the sake of, you know, going through these mountains and showing you what they are. Mount Hermon, that's where I believe the transfiguration happened, where Christ took them up on a high mountain and uh, transfigured before them. That's where I believe that happened. Uh, Mount Tabor is the proposed site of the transfiguration. That's where you'll see there's a cathedral up there. Um, We didn't actually go and see it ourselves, but that's where they believe it happened. I, I think it doesn't make sense, but that's a discussion for another time. And then uh, Mount Tabor is also uh, mentioned in the book of Judges with Deborah and Barak. They defeat the Canaanites there at Mount Tabor. So um, another historical figure that is, you know, just interesting to consider. And then Mount Gilboa, this is where Saul died, um, where he fell on his sword. And 
uh, there's actually a prophecy where in 2 Samuel 121, David curses the mountain with lack of rain, fruit, or fields. And a lot of people will look at Mount Gilboa now and say, well, clearly that's proof that David had no idea what he was talking about or is a false prophet because look, there's vegetation. And it is uh, apparently, like I've looked up pictures, it is a beautiful place at certain times of the year. But I think the prophecy still holds true. For one, most of the year, it's too tall a mountain for the rain to actually get over. And so these clouds go up to this mountain, but then rain on the other side of it, but not on one side. And so that's a possible way it could be fulfilled. It could also be fulfilled in the sense that it's not a place that's ever been um, like propagated for, like, specifically he says, no fruit or fields. And so... Uh, Maybe that's a way it's fulfilled because there's a lot of flowers there, a lot of good walking trails and vegetation, but not necessarily a place where you'd be growing crops. And then um, uh, the other way it could be fulfilled is just like maybe David didn't mean perpetually or forever. Um, But when we were there, I mean, it it was pretty dead. And our guide said, he's like, you know, I, I think even though all of the guides weren't necessarily religious, they looked at it and they're like, yeah, I mean, I go there and walk and it is uh lush and has a lot of vegetation, but I still see this as like potentially a fulfilled prophecy. Although I think they more saw it as David, um, kind of cursing the mountain to do what it already did, which is like not produce crops. So not so much a prophecy or a curse, but something where he's saying like, all right, you like wasteland of a mountain. Now you're going to stay a wasteland of a mountain because you were the place that allowed King Saul to die. So However you want to take that, I I don't care. I think I think it worked out how God meant it to work out one way or another, but this is the place where Saul died. And that's actually cool. I didn't realize it at the time, but we'd go later to a place called Bet Shean, and that was around this area of Mount Gilboa as well. So even though, you know, every day we're going to a different kind of area, different region, you kind of don't remember later you know, when we're in Bet Shean, I'm not thinking like, oh, there's Mount Gilboa that we saw from Mount Carmel. I'm just, I wasn't really piecing these things together. I'm kind of taking each site on its own, but it is cool to look across and uh, in hindsight, look back and be like, oh, okay. So that's where that was. And so that's what we did, um, up on Mount Carmel. It was a fairly brief stop. And after that, we stopped for lunch, um, kind of halfway down the mountain. And, um, yeah, not not much more to say about that. Just kind of a cool place to see for the site of Elijah's killing of the prophets of Baal. Whether that's the site or not, who knows? But so that that was cool, just to get an overall view of the landscape. And the last place we went to on this day was Megiddo. So we drove for a time and um, got to Megiddo. And this, the main thing I want to say about this, um, you know. It's, it's tough because while it was cool, it's definitely a historical archaeological site, definitely well-preserved. They've done a great job on the places they've rebuilt and maintaining the integrity of, of the history there. So really, really cool to see. But the, the reason people go to Megiddo in the first place is to see where they believe um, Armageddon would happen in the valley of Megiddo. The thing is, though... Um, I, I've started to think maybe this isn't where that final prophetic battle is going to take place for a couple reasons. So that's mainly what I want to go through with you. I will say, um, we got to the site and it was pretty cool because it is well-preserved. Uh, we got to go down into a cistern there, which was every time we went to a cistern in a place, I thought it was awesome. I'll talk about other ones in the future. Um, but I just thought it was cool. You go down all these stairs and then you're on rock stairs for a while and you can see where they would have walked down to go get their water. So I, I thought it was cool. Um, some people didn't like it as much because it is uh, just a lot of stairs. I mean, it was pretty steep on some places. And if we didn't know that it was going to be steep in those areas, um, you know, people got a little disappointed when they walked all the way down, realizing later that they have to walk all the way back up. Uh, but it was a cool site and there's different layers you can see here from like Canaanite periods and Israelite periods. And so our guide pointed those out, which was neat. It was windy. I mean, it was, uh, it's not really a mountain, which is kind of my first problem with this being 
the site of the last battle. Um, we'll talk about it in a second. But on the top of this place, it was crazy windy, which I thought felt, personally, I thought felt great. Um, did make it a little bit harder to hear. Uh, but when we're up there, uh, our guide, you know, kind of talked us through what living in a site like this would have looked like. And it was interesting at the very top, they kept horses. So they had like a stable and you would have had a place down below where you keep horses and a place up above where you keep horses so that if you're ever attacked, you can withdraw your, essentially what is your, your cavalry. So that was kind of cool. But the reason I don't, I'm not exactly convinced that this is the site of the final battle even though there is a large flat space where armies could gather, um, like the Bible mentions, a few things. So Ar Megiddon means Har, it's literally translated Har Megiddo. So mountain is Har and Megiddo is the place. So mountain of Megiddo, that's why they call it the Valley of Megiddo. But when you get to this site, there isn't a mountain. There is a tell where uh, things have been built up like this, you know, it was kind of constructed and then one civilization falls and another one builds on top of it and then they fall. Another one's built on top of it. So you do have this elevated area, but it's not a mountain. And especially it wouldn't have been a mountain in the time that this prophecy is written about. So if you go to a valley and you say this battle is at the mountain of Megiddo, but there is no mountain. There's just a valley. It, it kind of doesn't make sense. And so where could this final battle take place? And um, Dr. Michael Heiser, who's someone I really respect, um, passed away recently just this past year. He proposes, and as do other scholars that have questions about this Megiddo place, uh, he proposes that instead of Megiddo, which is made up of the Hebrew letters M G. D. Remember, there's no there's no vowels in the original Hebrew, so it'd just be Megiddo. You know, it's it, th- those vowels were kind of uh, written in later. This M G D, which some translate as Megiddo, could also be M O D, because that G, that letter that makes the G sound, is um, a softer G, and it can also make the O sound. So even though there's no vowels, there are some letters that make sounds similar to vowels like the like the yod can kind of be like a y sound so it could be like an i or a y so even though it's that's not like a vowel it kind of can make sounds like vowels and this this g in the middle of the mgd could have also been the letter that makes an o sound it makes an o or a g depending on um, the context that it's in actually i saved the article um, I'm going to look it up real quick because I, you know, I don't know Hebrew. I'm slowly, slowly, slowly learning some, especially just the letters of it. Um, okay. So, but yeah, I'm not an expert in it. So I wanted to have the, the article just to draw from, but like the, uh, like the city Gomorrah in Hebrew, that G is not a a hard G necessarily. So that letter is is Gimel, which is a hard G. But this is spelled with a letter called an Ayin. So it's more like Gamora, right? It's like the back of the throat G. And this Ayin can also make an O sound. So it's it's not just G. It's not a hard G. It's in the back of the throat and often can make the O sound as well. Um, for example, in the word moed or meeting place, um, or meeting time or place of meeting, whatever moed, the Hebrew word has this, um, ayin sound. And so what if instead of M G D or, um, mim, uh, gimel and daleth, instead we have this ayin in the middle and it would be M O D. In which case, Har Megiddo could instead be Har Moed or Mountain of Meeting. So this is what leads some people to think that this final battle, Ar Megiddon, is actually Ar Moed, meaning Mountain of the Place of Meeting, which in Isaiah refers only to 
Jerusalem. And this makes sense to me because in Revelation, it also talks about armies going up against Jerusalem. So I could see all these armies gathering from different areas and they're meeting at the base of where Jerusalem is. And this is, um, you know, kind of the site of the last battle before the return of Christ. This battle that actually in prophecy never takes place because Christ returns just before, um, just before humanity can kind of destroy itself. So could Jerusalem be the site of Armageddon as we know it instead of this Megiddo? I think it's very possible. Also, you know, armies don't fight like they used to. They don't need wide open fields in order to gather their mass armies. They fight very differently. So um, the fact that Megiddo has wide open spaces only speaks against it being a mountain and really isn't necessary for fulfillment of the prophecy. So those are just some things to consider. Uh, I'm not saying it has to be Jerusalem and it couldn't ever be Megiddo, but I think you got to do a lot more footwork in order to make it Megiddo, even though I understand that's been the tradition, but it could be tradition based off of a mistranslation. So just something to consider there. And so this pretty much concludes the day. Um, after this, all we did was drive to the Galilee region up to Tiberias, and we'll talk a little bit more about that region in future episodes. Um, but this concluded day five. And so we got to Galilee, got to our hotel, beautiful hotel, beautiful scenery right on the Sea of Galilee. So you can look out and see the place that is so concretely connected to Jesus and uh, his life and ministry. And so it was great to be there uh, at a beautiful place. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that region. So just some general notes. At this point in the trip, um, my feet are absolutely killing me. These new shoes that I have that I'm breaking in are just wrecking um, the sides of my feet up to my pinky toe. And so every day I'm wrapping my little toe in toilet paper and band-aids to try and get some padding in there. And that helped. But still, man, they hurt so bad. Just on that one area, just rubbed against, rubbed against my toe. And so that was rough for all the walking, but I appreciate all the people that got me band-aids, um, throughout the trip, really looking out, looking out for me. So thanks for that. And then also, uh, the hat that I wore was just covered in salt stains. Like it looked like, it looked like a pattern on my hat, almost like it had been dyed this tie dye of like salt mountains up and down my hat all the way around. So every day I had this like process of like, putting on my salt stain hat and wrapping my toe in toilet paper. And that's just a little logistics note for kind of how, how the trip was going, uh, physically, but you know, wasn't that important in the end. I got used to the, the pain on my feet or just on my toes. It wasn't even so much walking that like my feet hurt. It was just these new shoes absolutely killing me. But even with all that, I couldn't, uh, mood couldn't be dampened and it was really good to be there. The hat is just funny cuz it looked ridiculous and it it was a testament to how much how much salt I was losing through my sweat and how much I was sweating in the first place, but if you ever see me, let me know. I'll show you that picture cuz it is it's pretty crazy. The hat cleaned out once I got home, so that was nice. Uh so that concludes day 5. Day 6 we'll pick up in the Galilee region and there's so much to learn from this spot. So Thanks very much for listening and I'll talk to you guys later.